Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Light at Lunch. My name is Kim Goff. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the territory of the, so of the Lekwungen, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And we're gathered here today for a presentation by Dr. Victoria Arbor. Now, while I don't know specifics about the Lekwungen experiences with fossils, uh, First Nations people were the first discoverers of fossils and trackways in North America. And in some instances, it was them who brought it to the attention of the Europeans who were here. While we talk today about discoveries and excavations, let us all keep in mind the original peoples of British Columbia and their relationships to the land and all who dwelled here. Welcome back to Live at Lunch, and for some of you, welcome for the first time. Uh, if this is your first time, this is a monthly series that happens on the first Wednesday of the month from 12 to 1, uh, approximately 45 minutes long, and then there's time at the end for a Q&A. Today we have Dr. Victoria Arbor, Curator of Paleontology here at the Royal BC Museum. If you follow the Paleo News, her name should be familiar to you. She is a world-renowned expert in armored dinosaurs, known as Ankylosaurs. And in December of 2022, her research with Dr. David Evans into the use of tail clubs of Ankylosaurs made international news. Today, she is sharing the exciting stories from behind the scenes of our new feature exhibition, Dinosaurs at BC. Please welcome Dr. Victoria Arbor. I'll go maskless for speaking today. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, this is gonna be a little bit of behind the scenes of the exhibit that we just opened that I'm really excited to finally have open. It was a very many years in progress kind of project. And um, what I'd really like you to take away from this is that uh, that exhibit and this talk is not the be all and end all of what we know about dinosaurs in the province. In fact, I would argue we're still very much at the, like, the beginning of understanding about dinosaurs in BC. So let's get into it. First, I'd like to acknowledge that the fossils that I'm talking about here today uh, originated from the traditional territories of the Gitxsan and Taltan peoples, the Comox, Tla'amin, and Qualicum First Nations, the Kuchinaha Nation, and also from Treaty 8 territory. And I've also had quite a lot of funding from various organizations as well that I'm very appreciative of because fieldwork is really expensive sometimes. Um, so <clears throat> although we tend not to think about British Columbia as a place where you find a lot of dinosaur fossils, it is actually a place that we find dinosaur fossils or else we wouldn't have this exhibit and this talk going on today. Uh, but a lot of that research has been sort of very start and stop over a long period of time. It hasn't been going on for as long as say places like Alberta where there's been very consistent sort of sustained collecting for over a hundred years at this point. Um, and yeah, so there, you know, it's been a lot patchier, um, but in fact, some of the earliest scientific Western studies of dinosaur footprints uh, are in, or sorry, of dinosaurs from British Columbia are these footprints found in the Peace River region um, up in the Peace region of Northeastern British Columbia. And so these were actually reported in sort of the 1920s and first published on in a scientific paper in 1930. And they're really, really great footprints. And there were a lot of them. Um, they were found a lot on the banks of the Peace River. Um, there were beautiful, I'll use my little pointer without ruining everything here. So there, there are these wonderful trackways. This is a trackway of a sort of fairly large meat-eating dinosaur. There's another one going across here. There's more footprints here. Um, and so th this was a really important study. Uh, they were really excellently preserved. There were multiple new types of dinosaur footprints that were given species names. This is a slightly weird thing about dinosaur fo footprints is we give them species names like we do to dinosaur bones. Uh, and yeah, really landmark study. But then basically nothing happened for a really long time with these footprints until the late 1970s because the Peace River footprints are now all underwater in Williston Lake. And so um, these footprints, all of those ones in that photo are all lost to science now, basically. So my PhD supervisor, Phil Curry, uh, actually undertook study of these track sites um, as one of his first projects at the Provincial Museum of Alberta in the late 1970s. So they mounted several major expeditions to go and sort of emergency document more and more of these trackways and footprints. They made beautiful maps and took lots of photographs and actually did collect quite a few footprints. So they collected originals, which is very challenging. Sometimes they also did like latex peels of the trackway surfaces. All of that material is at the Royal Terrell Museum, but I am told that quite a bit of it was actually designated to be set aside to come to the Royal BC Museum 
at some point, but we just physically don't have the space for them. So I'm actually quite excited with the development of the new collections and research facility that in the not immediate future, but we might actually work on getting some of that material here into BC, um, which is really interesting both because they're cool dinosaur footprints and they have a very interesting historical connection with the creation of the Bennett Dam. So we basically had this sort of interesting study in the 1930s, a little bit more work in the 1980s, and then it just went quiet again, and that was about it. I think part of the problem is that there is so much focus on Alberta where the dinosaur bones are relatively easy to get at, and they're like complete skeletons, and there's lots of them. Uh, and a lot of th this area is just actually kind of hard to get at in British Columbia, so it's just really remote. So I think it's just people have to prioritize their time and their resources, and they went elsewhere. So we jump forward in time to the year 2000, the summer of 2000, um, when a really interesting discovery was made by two boys uh, inner tubing down a creek or river in the Tumblr Ridge area. And I think one of them basically like sort of wiped out of his inner tube and swam over to the shore and they realized that there were dinosaur footprints there. So that's these sort of outlined in white here. You've got foot, 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 and these little crescents are in the hands. And these are footprints of an armored dinosaur, an ankylosaur. And it turned out that there's actually a lot of armored dinosaur footprints in this area. Mo many of the creeks, if you walk along them long enough, there are dinosaur footprints in the Tumblr Ridge area. And so um, uh, one of these kids was the, the son of Charles Helm, who was the, the doctor in Tumblr Ridge. He thought these were really interesting and reported them to uh, my colleague, Rich McCray. Uh, and his wife, Lisa Buckley. And then they actually ended up spending a lot of their career doing research on the dinosaur footprints in the Tumblr Ridge area. Um, there's actually so many dinosaur sites in the Tumblr Ridge like town and surrounding area that they put together a bid to become a UNESCO Global Geopark, which is basically a UNESCO category for recognizing sites with significant geological heritage. Um, so it's a really important area, but I feel like if you're sort of outside of the Tumblr Ridge area, you might not necessarily know about all of these amazing discoveries up there. Um, they also helped put together and found the Tumblr Ridge Museum, which if you're up in the area is a really fun museum to visit. Um, they've got some dinosaur skeletons on display. They've got lots of the footprints that they've found in the area on display, as well as other different types of fossils that you can find in the area. And they have a really massive collection of dinosaur footprints and, and interesting fossils. Um, and so Rich and Lisa have kind of moved on to other activities lately, but I really just want to give a sort of recognition of the work that they put in for quite a long time in raising the profile of dinosaurs and dinosaur research in the province, which I hope that I can continue here. So we're going to get slightly technical here for a minute, but don't be too worried about this diagram. What we're looking at here is the distribution of known dinosaur fossil occurrences in British Columbia by rock type, like rock unit, through time. So this is the geologic time scale. Over here you can see the word Jurassic and the word Cretaceous. So those are two of the um, three main units of time uh, that dinosaurs lived. You don't have to worry about these, but geologists like to subdivide even further the geologic time scale into all of these very technical sounding words. When you read geologic time, um, oldest is at the bottom and youngest is at the top. Uh, and so what you can see here is that our record of dinosaurs actually extends from about like 150 million years all the way up to 66 million years, the end of the age of dinosaurs. So this is a really amazing record that we can do a lot with as researchers. Um, and you don't get this kind of record elsewhere. So what does that actually mean? So in terms of dinosaurs that we know from bones, um, we actually have a decent record of what types of dinosaurs are represented here. It's just that all of the bones are quite fragmentary. <laughs> so sometimes we know of these dinosaurs from like one bone, sometimes it's from a few, and in a rare, rare couple of cases it's actually from like most of a skeleton. Um, but this is actually not a terrible record for a place that hasn't had a lot of work put into it, all things considered, compared to other places. So we know that we've got armored dinosaurs and plant eaters. We have an ornithomimid dinosaur, big tyrannosaurs and duckbills, and our little friend Ferrosaurus, whose nickname is Buster, who I'll talk about later. So there's a decent record, but they're all kind of just in sort of single occurrences in a couple of these rock units or rock formations. And really, most of the understanding of dinosaurs in British Columbia comes from dinosaur footprints. And some people will be like, oh, well, that's not really like dinosaur fossils. But they are fossils. They're fossils of dinosaurs. 
and they give us a different signal and different information than bones do. So dinosaur bones are great because you can usually get a pretty good idea of the specific kind of dinosaur and its anatomy and how it's related to other dinosaurs. Um, you might not be able to get all of that information from footprints, but footprints are made while the animal is alive. So you get things like behavior and how it's moving. Um, and it's just a different set of information. And even though it's a little harder to assign specific footprints to very specific species, we still can get sort of broad patterns of types of dinosaurs. So dinosaurs do still have sort of differently shaped feet and leave different types of footprints. Um, and so there's actually quite a diversity, and I'm sure that I'm missing some here, but this is a pretty nice diversity of different types of dinosaurs um, represented by footprints. And if we combine that together in this particular diagram, we're looking at orange are dinosaurs known only from footprints, purple is ones known only from bones, and green are the few rare cases where we have both footprints and bones in the same formation. And so, yeah, this is actually a lot of different dinosaurs represented here if you combine these two data sets. And what's really great is because we have this long period of time represented, we can also see how dinosaur communities and ecosystems are changing through time. So we can see that there's certain types of dinosaurs like big allosauroid predators and sauropods that we find in the early Cretaceous and then not later. And we also see things like tyrannosaur predators um, only in the late Cretaceous and not earlier. And then there's some like my favorite ankylosaurs who are just there the whole time doing their thing. Um, and so just for comparison, what most of the fossil record of Alberta, which has the much better known kind of like publicly known paleontology, is really just looking at these last two periods, the Campanian and Mastrichtian, which are about the last 20 to 25 million years of the Cretaceous. So they have like a much more detailed knowledge of dinosaurs from that time period, but we have a much longer record and can just ask different kinds of questions in some ways. So again, it's, it's just a, a different type of data and a different data set, but I'm really excited by what we can do with this kind of information and being able to ask those sort of long time period questions on how things are changing, I think is super interesting. Uh, so in the Dinosaurs of BC exhibit, we do not highlight all of this because that's actually a lot of different dinosaurs and different types of areas and, and time periods. So really the Dinosaurs of BC exhibit is just giving us a little bit of a greatest hits of dinosaur fossils in the province. And so I've circled here the different dinosaurs that are highlighted in the exhibit and I wanted to sort of go through them and talk about a little bit more about those stories and then hopefully after this presentation or sometime in the future you can go up and check out some of these fossils in the exhibit yourself. So let's start with our oldest ones here, the sauropod or long-necked dinosaurs. These are some of the oldest dinosaurs that we find in British Columbia and we know about them from their footprints. So this is an example of a sauropod trackway. If you can see these big circular depressions, kind of thinking a little step, 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 step here. Those are big sauropod feet. Um, and these have been found in a couple places in BC, but in the exhibit, we're highlighting the ones from the southeastern part of the province in the Kootenays um, near the town of Sparwood. So in sort of the Elk River, Elk, Elk Valley. And these are actually being uncovered in the, um, in the coal mines that are active down there. So it's a very interesting, um, a very interesting sort of combination of industry partnership and museum partnership here to help document these things. So basically, as they're going through these coal mines and, and stripping the rock away every now and then, they reveal surfaces uh, that don't have coal. They have the sort of mud flats that would have surrounded the swampy areas where the coal is forming. And we get dinosaur footprints, which is great. And we don't just get sauropod footprints, but I think the sauropods are pretty cool. Um, What's pretty interesting is that the sauropods are not known from bones anywhere in Canada. Um, we only have a record of them in Canada through the footprints in British Columbia. So this is actually a pretty special occurrence. Um, and yeah, these are, these are the sauropods that would have left these footprints were probably somewhat closely related to things like Brachiosaurus. So these ones that kind of have their necks a little bit more upright and kind of a shorter tail and kind of longer arms. Um, and yeah, and this is probably very close to what it would have looked like in order for them to leave those big circular footprints on the areas. And then one of the other neat things about working with the coal mine in particular is that they, they can't easily collect the actual footprints themselves. And so the way that they are documenting these so that we can add them to the museum's collection is they are basically using a drone to take lots of photographs of the surface of the trap site. So this is the software that I use to basically make 3D models using photographs of the footprints. So you can see down here, I've got like hundreds and hundreds of photos lined up. 
And then I have some specialized software that through many rounds of processing basically interpolates those and can create a 3D model that I'm showing here. And so we basically have these fossils in the collection as digital only fossils. So we don't have the original rocks and we don't have sort of silicone or latex peels of them. They just exist as this sort of bits and bytes kind of thing. But what's really cool about that is that makes it really easy to share with other researchers. And in the exhibit, the, the fossils that you'll see, um, there's a life-size footprint that was basically CNC fabricated from this digital file. And then there's a miniature full-size trackway that we printed on a 3D printer and then made a cast and mold of. So it's a pretty interesting technology that lets us record things that we wouldn't have been able to preserve before and then exhibit them in sort of new interesting ways that we couldn't have before. We also, in our collection, have a couple of other specimens from um, not that specific coal mine, but one of the other ones operating in the area, the uh, Fording River coal mine. Uh, and one of my grad students, Teague Dixon, has been recently looking at some of these mysterious mm -hmm. footprints that were down on these giant blocks that were kind of sort of forgotten about in our basement collection and had mysterious information associated with them. And so there's these little three-toed footprints, and uh, Teague has figured out that these are from a uh, much smaller than a sauropod, a small plant-eating animal sort of re related to Hypsilophodon, which I realize is not a very household name type of dinosaur, but it's a small plant eater kind of related to the later big duck-billed dinosaurs. Um, yeah, so we have some neat stuff in our collection that we couldn't put on display yet either, but I still think it's pretty fun. Okay, so let's jump forward in time a little bit. So we were down here, and now we're up here in the Cenomanian, the mid-Cretaceous, for context, the sauropod footprints are, let's say, about 140 million years old. And then the, the one I'm going to talk about next is about 100 million years old. So that's about a 60 million year difference. And the end of the age of dinosaurs is 66 million years ago. So there's actually almost as much time between these two fossils as there is between T-Rex and us, um, just to give you a sense of the scope of geologic time that we're talking about here. Um, okay, so let's talk about armored dinosaurs. So as I mentioned before, the area around Tumblr Ridge is just like littered with ankylosaur trackways and footprints. And that also goes for um, uh, not sort of too far away, but up near Chetland, um, sort of up, again, up in the Peace region. And so this is a, an example of a, an ankylosaur hind footprint. It's this little blobby thing here uh, that Derek and I collected a couple years ago when we were up visiting the area. And what's really fun is that uh, we know uh, generally what kind of armored dinosaur this came from. There are two groups within armored dinosaurs. There are the ankylosaurid ankylosaurs, which are the ones with tail clubs that I really like. And then there are the lesser ankylosaurs, the notosaurid ankylosaurs that do not have a tail club and so are not as good, uh, but are still pretty good. <laughs> um, and so they always keep their flexible tail and they've got these cool big shoulder spikes, which are fine if that's what you're into. Um, so one really neat thing is notosaurids have four toes and ankylosaurids have three toes. And because these footprints are all from four-toed ankylosaurs, we know that it's basically just notosaurid ankylosaurs that are living in this area at that time. So I think that's kind of fun. So we knew that there were lots of footprints in this area, but in fact, it turns out there are also some very rare ankylosaur bones from this area, uh, from the Dunbeg information up near Chetwind. And so this particular specimen, um, I put some more complete ones next to it just for comparison. This is on display up in the exhibit. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is sort of the, the, spinous, the spine process on your vertebra. These are backbones. So this is kind of the disc part of the vertebra and then the, the sort of spiny things that stick off the top and the side of a vertebra. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is the sort of spine of one and one of the other little processes and then the centrum or the body of the vertebra of another one. Um, it's not the world's most beautiful fossil, but we can tell from this that it is from an ankylosaur. And what's also interesting is that this is one of the earliest collected fossils by a Western scientist. So it actually was collected in like 1930 and then sat around until 2020 before myself and Derek and some of our colleagues identified it. Um, it had been collected by a, a geologist with the geological survey in Ottawa and sent back with that material. And then it was just kind of like on display in their public offices. And then one of my colleagues saw it and was like, that looks interesting. Where is that from? That's from British Columbia and that's kind of weird. Uh, and they were like, here, why don't you work on it? And so now we've been able to figure out that it's actually uh, one of the only records of ankylosaur bones from the province, except for one other one, which my, colleague, uh, which my grad student, Emily Cross, who is sitting in the back, uh, is working on. So there was another secret uh, armored dinosaur bone hanging out in the Hudson's Hope Museum collections. Uh, collected from pretty close by. And so one of the projects Emily has been working on during her time here 
is trying to figure out what kind of dinosaur it is, and we're pretty sure that this is a femur or a thigh bone from an ankylosaur, a relatively small one, so that's pretty interesting. The whole femur is only actually about this big. Uh, and yeah, so she's having fun working away on that, and maybe some more armored dinosaur bones will show up over time as well. Okay, we're going to jump forward in time again. We're now sitting around like 75 to 85 million years ago in the late Cretaceous, and we're going to also jump a little bit closer to home, uh, to Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. So most of the most of Vancouver Island, sort of the east coast of it, um, preserves a rock group called the Nanaimo group, named after the city of Nanaimo. Uh, and that rock unit was deposited mostly in ocean and marine environments. So a variety of sort of like shallow water and beach and nearshore environments, all the way down to very deep sea, uh, very deep water environments. And that's basically recording sort of the accretion or the glomming on of what would become Vancouver Island onto Western North America. So British Columbia has a really complicated, interesting geological history where we're basically made up of all these like mm -hmm. islands that kind of smush onto the west coast of uh, North America and just keep like accreting on over time. And we're still doing that. And that's why we get earthquakes here, because um, eventually one day Vancouver <sighs> Island will just fully crash into the rest of North America and become fused to it. Um, and so, again, most of this area was underwater at the time of the dinosaurs, uh, and it has a really amazing fossil record. And so there's a lot of, like, um, fossil enthusiasts, amateur paleontologists, professional paleontologists that come and collect on Vancouver Island. Uh, and we've got wonderful collections of things like ammonites, the sort of coil-shelled squid relatives, um, clams, snails, sea urchins, fish, pr pretty much anything you can imagine, we have fossils of it. And we have a huge amount of those fossils in our collection because they're so close to home. There's also rare examples of marine reptiles, which are not dinosaurs. Uh, this particular fellow here is a mosasaur, uh, which is actually a very close relative of modern day monitor lizards like Komodo dragons. So they're actually quite distinct from dinosaurs, even though people tend to lump them together as like big lizards. But we do have exactly one so far, <laughs> fossil of a dinosaur from these deep ocean environments. Uh, and this is just different views of the, the same fossil. This is a caudal vertebra, so a tailbone, from a dinosaur that would have looked like this. So that's called an ornithomimid dinosaur. They're called ostrich mimic dinosaurs because they look a lot like ostriches, right down to the feathers. We know that they were preserved. <laughs> they, some have been found with feathers. We know they had fairly elaborate wing feathers. Um, and yeah, so basically picture like an ostrich with a long tail, and that's what these dinosaurs look like. And so this does not mean that these dinosaurs lived in the ocean. <laughs> this is an animal that clearly was living on the like North American coast, died, and somehow its carcass got swept out to sea, or at least that one particular bone got swept out to sea. And how it wound up there, we're not really sure. Was it a storm or a tsunami? Um, was it a carcass that just kind of floated out and then maybe got eaten by like marine reptiles or sharks or other scavengers? Um, but it's a pretty interesting record. And so that does suggest that, you know, with enough time, we will find more of these rare dinosaur fossils in these marine sediments in the Nanaimo group. And it also shows that they were living nearby in those coastal environments. This one's in the exhibit too, so you can go up and see that one. And then finally, we'll jump a little bit forward in time again to the very end of the Cretaceous. We're going to be looking at sort of the last two million years of the Cretaceous period in uh, a rock unit that's very close to my heart, um, the Sustut Basin, and the Sustut Group is the name of the rock. Um, this is an area of active research for me. So this is, I'm now going to sort of talk a lot more about our fieldwork and the research that we're doing here at the museum with the paleontology team. Um, the Sustut Basin is really interesting. It's this very funny sort of geological feature that forms a sort of uh, two-part crescent mm -hmm. in the north-central part of the province. Um, down here is approximately Smithers, and up here is approximately Dease Lake. So there is, it's not really super close to anything, um, but those are the nearest towns that people might know about. Uh, and it records a very long chunk of the Cretaceous period, but the fossils that I'm talking about are probably mostly found in the last two million years. And this story starts uh, actually a long time ago in 1971 with a geologist who was prospecting along the, at the time, in construction, Dease Lake extension of the BC rail line. 
Uh, and so a lot of ground had been cleared and he was hiking along looking for things like uranium and thorium and other economically valuable minerals. And he found a batch of bones and recorded it in his notes, uh, thought they might have been from a big Cretaceous sloth uh, and you know, recognized them as something interesting, but then ultimately held on to them uh, and didn't report them out anywhere. Uh, and that is until 2004, when uh, you know, many decades later, he had moved to Nova Scotia, where I am from originally, and donated these fossils to the Earth Sciences Department, where I was an undergrad. And my professors were like, hey, you're a nerd about dinosaurs, Victoria. Do you want to figure out what these are? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, so this became my very first research project, uh, my first scientific publication. Um, and it was just a really exciting project. So uh, when I was but a baby paleontologist, I could not really interpret what those bones were. I knew they were from some kind of small plant-eating dinosaur, but it actually took a long time for me to really figure it out and kind of revisit it. So um, we published the initial description in like 2008. I went off and got my master's and my PhD. And then as a postdoc at the ROM, I kind of wanted to revisit this particular project. Uh, and that was when eventually we realized, along with my, my co-author, David Evans, that these bones um, were from a type of dinosaur called a leptoceratopsid dinosaur and were a new species, which we named Ferrosaurus sustadensis, which means the iron lizard from the Sustut River, sort of referencing that was found on a railway line and um, along the Sustut River in northern BC. So uh, his nickname, though, because I knew this fossil for a very long time before it got its scientific name um, and needed something to call it, has been Buster. So if you go up to the exhibit, you will get to meet Buster, and we talk about him as Buster a lot. Uh, and yeah, he is like an old friend at this point, so that's pretty fun. Um, this is generally what Buster would have looked like. We don't have the full skeleton, and so we don't know, say, exactly what his face shape would have been like. But we actually have a pretty good idea of the overall proportions and overall shape of his, his body and his face and what he would have looked like. Um, and yeah, so these are relatives of Triceratops. They're much smaller. You'll see when you go up to the exhibit that they're kind of like a sheep with a long tail. Uh, and they don't have the big horns on the face that, that Triceratops does, but they do have a little frill and they've got the big parrot-like beak that Triceratops has. And uh, yeah, so they're kind of like a little group of dinosaurs called Leptoceratopsids that are related to the bigger horned Ceratopsid Ceratopsian mm -hmm. dinosaurs. The way that we were able to figure out it was a new species was by looking at its feet. And so that basically involved me going to lots of different museums and looking at many different Leptoceratopsid feet. There are two here. This is one from Montanoceratops. That's its little hand, which I think is cute. And this is another one called Ceracinops. That's also from Montana. Uh, and by building a big data set of information and lots of measurements, we realized that the proportions of the toes are actually quite distinct. So in most leptoceratopsids and most dinosaurs, the little bones, these are called phalanges, but they're basically just your little like individual finger bones. They usually get smaller as you go towards the claw, but in Buster, they actually stay about the same size. So it would have had slightly differently proportioned feet. This is probably not something you would see externally, really visibly on the living dinosaur. Um, but if we found another foot of a leptoceratopsid, we would be able to measure it and see whether or not it belongs to Ferrosaurus or a different species. So we call that a diagnostic character. We can use it to diagnose the species. And that's what helped us support it being a new species, among some other things. But Because um, I know a lot of people ask, like, how can you tell just from a few bones? And the answer is a lot of work and knowing a lot about anatomy. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was to go back to the Sustet River where Buster had originally been found. Um, and one, see if we could find any more of him, but two, just see what other fossils were up there because those bones are really nicely preserved. So there should be a good chance of finding more fossils. So while I was a postdoc at the Royal Ontario Museum before I came here to be the curator, um, I got some funding from National Geographic and in 2017, we went up to the Sustet River. Uh, we basically went to Smithers and then took a little bush plane about an hour north and stayed at this really cool fishing lodge um, and hiked around and looked for fossils. And one of the great things is that even though the person who found them, um, you know, it was pre like GPS units and being able to mark things on your phone, but he had taken really good notes and he had, I also interviewed him several times. He had a very good memory about where the fossils were found. So he's like, they were on the railway line and we know we were on the north side of the river. And I remember fishing on a little island here on my breaks. 
and it was like really close to the intersection of this uh, Bird Flat Creek with the Sustet River. So we knew we had a relatively narrow range of places to look for more of the bustard. Uh, so the one problem <laughs> is that this is pretty close to what it looked like in the 1970s while it was getting, um, when Buster was found, you know, uh, this is probably not really good environmentally, but it's good for finding fossils. Anyway, lots of rock exposed, uh, but the Dee Slake line was never completed. And so it got abandoned. Um, it's crazy. There's tracks laid and they got used by forestry companies for a while, logging companies, um, but it's basically been abandoned despite all of that work going in. So now it looks like this. Um, so there is a lot of like new shrubby, very impenetrable growth in the area. Uh, and not a lot of rock outcrop, which we knew would be possible going in, but it's still kind of a bummer. Um, so that being, so it was actually really tough going trying to find fossils here. Uh, but pretty much at the exact pinpointed spot where, where Kenny Larson, the geologist, thought he had found Buster, we found the only other vertebrate bone on our entire like 10 day expedition. And it is this little golf ball looking thing, um, which is actually the part of a shell of a fossil turtle. Um, a fossil turtle called Basilemes, which is actually a fairly large um, sort of pancake-shaped turtle that's relatively common in the very late Cretaceous of North America. So we feel pretty confident that Buster probably came from that specific spot. You can see mm -hmm. that fossil up in the exhibit. Um, we really wanted to find more of Buster and to find more bones, but it was not meant to be, unfortunately. Uh, but we did find lots of fossil plants and we collected um, chunks of rock to process for fossil pollen, which helped us get a general geological age on this particular unit. So it was a really successful expedition and we were able to be like, yep, that's probably where Buster came from, uh, but it was too bad. And I, I don't think it will be very easy to find more of him unless, unless there's like way more construction up there at some point in the future. So that's just one place though in this whole huge geological basin called the Sustut Basin. Um, so at the very least we have a little bit of a better idea of the the Sustut River um, fauna. We know we have Ferrosaurus Leptoceratopsic, we've got Basilemes the turtle, we've got a whole bunch of like different plants and that's not too bad for a place that was mostly forest so I feel like that's pretty good. But what about in other parts of the Sustet Basin. And uh, this is where things kind of come full circle in a really interesting way because uh, unbeknownst to me in 2013, the curator of botany here, Ken Marr, was up north in what is part of the Sustet Basin and found this Tyrannosaur tooth. Um, and so this sort of like blue pebble has these little serrations on the edge. And so we know that that comes from a Tyrannosaurid dinosaur. And so it actually turns out that there are a couple of places in the northern part of the basin uh, where we can find dinosaur fossils. Uh, two sites, at least, within Spatsizi Plateau Wilderness Provincial Park. So I was like, when I got my job here, I was like, all right, that's where we're going for field work, to find more dinosaurs. Because if you find one, there's a good chance you will find more. So in 2019, after I started my job here, we went up to the Spatsizi Plateau, which was really great. I was there with my colleague Tom Cullen and uh, former collections manager Jacqueline Richmond. And it was pretty great. You might notice that there are far fewer trees here, which is what we like as paleontologists. There's nothing wrong with forests, except when you want to find fossils. Uh, so this was much better because this is way more rock outcrop. Um, so we don't have any pesky trees. It's mostly lichen and then these huge cliff faces uh, full of lots of boulders. So this is very challenging prospecting, I would say. I did a lot of my geological and paleontological training in Alberta, where you're walking in kind of like badland environments, like deserts. Um, so scrambling over these giant boulders, um, I think that's, that's Tom and that's Jacqueline there. Um, and these are a lot of really big boulders and it's really easy to get your foot stuck in between them. Um, but this is great. So there's lots of rocks and uh, we spent sort of half of our first expedition not really finding a whole lot. We were kind of bummed out about it. We decided to move sites partly through. We went to this area um, within the park and within like an hour, we immediately started finding dinosaur bones and relatively good ones, all things considered. So what you're looking at here, you can see some white patches here. That's the fossil bone, but you can actually make out kind of an impression that goes all the way up along here and up to about there. So that is a basically complete large dinosaur rib that has mostly just eroded away recently, not sort of in the geological past. Um, so we didn't really have heavy equipment to actually collect large bones like that on this particular trip. 
the rocks are really hard and the boulders are really huge and we can't sort of chisel and hammer them away. Um, so we were like, okay, well, we might not be able to collect all of these things, but at least we've got like three or four more days to prospect around and see what we've got. Uh, later that day, um, the fog and the rain rolled in and we were like, oh, gross, that's bad. And then the next day we woke up to that in August, <laughs> which is a little much even for me as a Canadian. <laughs> Um, so that was the end of Spatsisi Plateau 2019, unfortunately, um, because there was no way that was going to melt before we had to leave. So we basically just had to bail a few days early. Um, these two tents collapsed later that day. So all three of us were hanging out in my uh, boss tent, we called it, so, which is technically only a two-person tent. So that was fun. We're all kind of like smooshed up in there. Um, yeah, so that was an adventure. So uh, then uh, 2020 happened and nothing was really going on field work wise. And in 2021, I had a baby. So last year was the first year we were able to get back to Spatsisi Plateau. So this is great. So there's me again. Um, my summer student last year, Brady McBride and Derek Larson, our, our newer collections manager. Um, and uh, literally our first day, <laughs> I was like, we'll go in July this time. <laughs> it maybe it won't snow on us. And literally the day we got, we the helicopter left and it started doing little snow pellets on us. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> and so we lost day one to snow, which was too bad. But thankfully that was much less bad and it basically cleared up by the end of that day. So that was good. But I think I might just be cursed <laughs> to have snow at some point, no matter what time of year I go. Um, I'm glad you all laugh at this too, because I got there and was like, it's so expensive to come here. <laughs> we have to find something. Um, but thankfully, uh, it did not disappoint. We had a great field season. Um, Brady was particularly great. He was like our little finder. So we would just shoo him off to go find things and flag them for us. And then Derek and I would work on cutting them out of the ground. Um, he did a great job. This is probably part of a, this is like a pelvic bone from a large plant eating dinosaur probably. Uh, in total, we found, I think we collected about like 18 bones, but we saw like 50 uh, in various states of preservation that weren't necessarily things we would want to spend our time collecting. Um, but it's actually surprisingly rich up there, which is great. Um, some of them are really nicely preserved and they're just sitting there at the surface. This is the, a rib head, so basically the part of the rib that connects to your backbone um, that of course we found on our last day, so we didn't collect it. Uh, it's really hard going to collect stuff here. Um, the rocks, like I said, are really hard um, and we can't really use sort of our traditional tools we would use if we were in Alberta. So we end up taking our trusty uh, rock saw, which we have nicknamed Gertie, <laughs> into the field with us. And it basically involves us um, uh, cutting down into the rock and then using a big, big heavy chisel and a big heavy crack hammer or rock hammer. And we basically cut like a little grid pattern and knock little cubes off until it's a small enough size to go in our backpack mm -hmm. and then go in the helicopter. I should mention it's about an hour helicopter flight to actually get us dropped off there. So it's a two hour round trip. Uh, so weight is a real problem because they have to have enough fuel to actually get us out there and back. Um, but this is what we this is what we collected. It's all kind of sitting up in my office. It doesn't really look like a lot right now. It's mostly wrapped up in sort of protective plaster bandages or in paper towel. And um, Emily and Teague were doing some work uh, preparing the fossils over the last few months. And it's just really slow going, even with sort of heavy duty tools. So we still have a lot of work to do to actually figure out what we've got. Um, but we're hoping to go back this summer. I am probably going to be taking a six person crew instead of three people. So we're actually really excited to see what we can accomplish. And of course, on our last day in the field last year, we found like the best spot yet with like really nice big dinosaur bones. So we couldn't do anything because it was the last day. But uh, well, that's going to be our first day this year, provided it doesn't snow. So, so we're hoping to get out there in sort of late July and um, yeah, I hope you'll stay tuned. You can see quite a lot of information about our adventures up in the exhibit. So we have lots of photos and videos if you want to learn more about what it's like to do work up there and see some of the fossils that have already been found. So that's basically what's sort of covered in the exhibit. Uh, but I wanted to just sort of finish off by talking about one other field project that we're hoping to start this summer. Um, and that has jumped back in time to the Actaean and Albion, so about 115, 120 million years ago. Uh, and this is a really cool dinosaur footprint site up on uh, your Hudson's Hope. 
called the Carbon Creek track site. What's really exciting about this particular track site is this is basically the same kind of rocks and same kind of deposit as all of those footprints that were flooded by the creation of the Bennett Dam. So uh, this is the, the first occurrence of fossils in, like this in that area since the dam was constructed and flooded all of the known sites. So it's really scientifically interesting. It also seems to contain even more types of dinosaurs than we knew about before. This is a little video of me walking along just one track site. Um, this was initially reported in 2008 uh, and some uh, excavation was done by the Tumblr Ridge Museum crew, Rich and Lisa, our colleagues up there. Uh, and they uh, excavated about 800 meters of it, but the total track site is probably at least 3,500 square meters, which is huge. And it's flat, which is amazing because most dinosaur footprints in British Columbia are like, like vertical. Uh, so really hard to study. So it's flat and there's like this much rock over top of it. So it's basically like a paleontologist's dream site because we don't have to shovel or like for days and days just to like see a footprint. Um, so we're really excited about this. Um, this is probably what we're going to go check out in August. Um, just to give you a sense of the really nice preservation of the footprints that have already been excavated. Um, there's these beautiful, uh, lots of different types of three-toed footprints. Most dinosaurs have three toes on their feet, or at least many of them have three toes. So it can be a little hard to tell them apart, but this one's probably from sort of like a medium-sized plant-eating dinosaur, like an iguanodont. Uh, this one that my head is next to has very narrow pointy toes, so that might be from a sort of medium-sized meat eater. There's also some very large meat-eating dinosaur footprints here. And the one that's really cool is that there's a sauropod trackway. So this is the only other known occurrence of sauropods in British Columbia. There's my foot, and I mean, I don't have like really big feet, so that's a really big dinosaur. Those are little claws at the top, they have claws on their toes. Um, and there's some other things that are really fun um, that I won't talk about today, but I, I'm excited. We're going to go and basically sort of clean up the site, map it, um, take lots of photos so we can make those digital models. We might make some silicon peels and mold and cast the footprints. And we're also going to work on expanding out what's known. So we probably won't uncover a lot of new material this year. We're basically going to go and get kind of a feel for what's involved in that. Um, but hopefully this will become like a multi-year project where we can actually uncover the full the full site. And uh, we're also hoping that we'll get to work really closely with the Soto First Nation and the West Moberly First Nation. I had a really great chat with them last year and they're very interested in this from like a scientific perspective and sort of knowing more about the land. Um, yeah, so I hope there will be some really great knowledge sharing that way as well. So, so I'm going to basically end there. I hope the main takeaway is that there is just like so much more to find and we just have to put feet on the ground and find things. Um, but it's challenging. It's a lot of work to actually go do this kind of research. It can sometimes be expensive, um, but it's very rewarding. And there's just like tons of interesting scientific questions we can ask and answer using fossils from BC. In addition to just dinosaurs are fun and cool and it's neat to know what lived here a long time ago. So um, yeah, so I hope that you will check out the exhibit as well, but I'm also very, very happy to answer questions about the talk or just if you have general dinosaur questions, that's fine too. So thank you very much for your attention.